to share your screen and I'll right. uh, make the introduction. Okay, just to confirm that we're live. Okay. Okay. So, um, before I formally introduce the speaker, I'd like to remind the audience, both here at Zoom and at YouTube, that you may type your questions and we will relay them to Professor Nogales at the end of the colloquium and when she uh, opens the, the space for, for the questions. So now for the proper introduction. Oh, it's a great honor and privilege to have Professor Eva Nogales at this week's, as this week's speaker in the ICTP SAFER IFT UNESP Physics Discussions Colloquium Series. Um, Professor Nogales earned her PhD in biophysics from the University of Kiel in the UK and she now holds several positions, among which are Howard Hughes Medical Institute Invest Investigator, Professor of Biochemistry, Biophysics and Structural Biology at UC Berkeley and Senior Faculty Scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Um, her research is dedicated to the visualization of macromolecular function, and she's a leader in combining cryo-OEM, computational image analysis and biochemical assays to gain insights into function and regulation of biological complexes and molecular machines. So today she will talk about visualizing biological molecules, the cryo-EM revolution. So Professor Nogales, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, today um, I'm gonna be introducing you to the technique of cryo-electron microscopy, which uh, has really, undergo a quantum leap um, in capabilities in the last 10 years or so, and has really caused a revolution in the structural biology field that is dedicated to the visualization of biological molecules. Um, so I myself was trained as an undergraduate as, uh, as, a, a, as a physicist. Um, so I'm gonna try to at least appeal to, the, to, to you guys um, and introduce some basic con um, context that hopefully uh, makes some sense. Um, for some of you may be very simplistic. Um, I apologize is that the case, but I thought we would all get up, uh, you know, start from, from, from a common base. So um, in, in the structural biology, there is what we call a central dogma that has to do with the flow of information um, that goes from DNA um, to RNA, which is another form of nucleic acid, to protein, uh, which is ultimately the functional unit in the cell. And in DNA, which is where our genetic information is stored, the unit of information is, is a gene. And there is um, machinery that is referred to as RNA polymerase that is able to copy one gene at a time, generating molecules of messenger RNA that then are translated by another large macromolecular assembly inside cells, the ribosome, to produce protein. And as I said, proteins are the functional units in the cell um, that carry out all uh, essential functions from structural to enzymatic, uh, et cetera. So uh, a structural biology is dedicated to the study of this set of uh, biological macromolecules. Um, and the idea is that if we study, you know, if we are able to visualize the structure, we will learn about how the mo that those molecules function. And why is it relevant to, to study this relationship between structure and function? And obviously, you know, we want to gain a fundamental understanding of what the molecular basis of cellular function are at the detail level um, that ultimately uh, speaks of the chemistry, you know, the, the, the bonds, um, the interactions between these macromolecules and the physics, you know, the, the motions, the forces, the work that is being carried, that is carried out by these by these um, molecules. Um, 
So I, I love to show images like this of David Goodsell, who's a, is a biologist, but also is an artist. And he makes these gorgeous renditions of what would be the inside of cells that are based on uh, information from a structural biology, all these shapes that you see, the colors are invented, but the shapes are actually based on actual experiments and actual determination of, of a structure. And as well as other sources of information that allowed him to put these molecules into context in the right amounts uh, and to give us an idea of how crowded and, and, and intricate, in, um, intricate the, 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 the cell is. Um, in a structural biology, although things are about to change, the way a structure is determined is by purifying when one particular macromolecular uh, assembly out of the cell, concentrating it, and then looking at it by different biophysical uh, techniques of which cryo-electron microscopy is one of them. Okay, so, but a structure is a study in a structure function also have particle applications. One is understanding human disease, for, for example, mutations um, that give rise to mutations in a certain gene typically translates into the wrong amino acid in a protein that then ends up having the wrong shape, the wrong chemistry of the wrong physics. And to be able to locate those mutations in the context of this physical body of, of, the, of the structure of, of the protein um, is just very critical for us to understand what is wrong, what has gone wrong with that mutation. In a more positive uh, way, um, a structure is used all the time for drug design or dr drug improvement. And the idea is that a small molecules um, can be shaped and, and have the right chemistry to bind to pockets on the surface of these proteins and change the shapes, change the allosteric communication through the protein and alter the way the protein function, the, the protein's activity. So in some cases, these small molecules can modify the activity. In some cases, they can enhance the activity. Most typically, they eliminate um, the activity. It's a, it's a lot easier to break something that, than to give it new function. So um, almost most of the pharmaceuticals that you take when you're treating different uh, ailments um, act this way. They bind to a target protein in a pocket and they do it with high affinity, high specificity. They don't bind to other things, they bind there and change the protein in a particular way. And having the structure um, with the details of the chemistry of that surface allows for the improvement of, of these uh, drugs, both in terms of affinity and specificity. But let's think, um, let's think a scale when we're talking about visualizing um, biological macromolecules. Uh, so I made this for some, uh, for a layman uh, presentation um, at, at Berkeley. So let's think in terms of meters, you know, meter or, or something of that order is what we used to in, in, our, in, in our normal life is the size of a pup, you know, around the size of a dog. And this is something that we can see very easily with our eyes. But let's think of a flea that is in the leg of the dog. Uh, this is now of about a millimeter size, a thousand times smaller than the dog. And for that, someone like me that is going on in age a little bit would probably need a magnifying glass. But let's think of now uh, a bacteria that is in the leg of the flea. That would be about a micron in size. So it's a millionth of the size of the dog. And for that, you know, just to detect that the bacteria is there, uh, we will need minimally a good optical microscope. Um, but what I'm talking about is looking at individual um, macromolecules that exist inside, in this case, a bacterial cell or, or one of our cells. And those are of the order of nanometers. So we are talking now um, a billionth of the size of, of the dog. And for these, if we want to do direct visualization, we need powerful transmission electron microscope to visualize them. So, so just a little aside, how can you generate contrast 
using electrons um, that allows you to visualize the position of atoms um, in, in, a, in a macromolecule. And this has to do with the fact that for the electrons that we're using that are typically 100, um, 100 to 300 kilo electron volts, um, um, electrons are gonna go through your sample. Many of them uh, are just gonna go through without any interaction. This is especially the case for light atoms um, in, 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 macro, in macromolecules, which are mostly made of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Some of them, however, will be elastically scattered by the Coulomb potential of the nucleus with some uh, screening for, from the electrons. And it will be the interference of the elastically and un unscattered electrons as they're brought together by the um, ob objective lens that will give rise to phase contrast, that interference phase contrast that will allow us to get information on the position of the atom uh, in the sample. But this is gonna be very important for, um, for biological molecules. There are electrons um, that we have generated that are going through a sample that will actually interact with the electrons in the sample. In doing so, so the primary beam will lose energy and they will pass it on to the sample um, this, in many cases, will result in the ejection of an electron, the ionization, the generation of radical molecules that will then uh, diffuse and break, all, you know, covalent bonds and really disint disintegrate the sample. So inelastic scattering is really bad. It happens at a certain ratio with respect to elastic scattering, which is the good one. Inelastic scattering is bad for two reasons. One. Um, the electrons that go through after being inelastically scattered now will give rise to a uh, chromatic aberration because now the electromagnetic lenses in the electron microscope will not be will not focus them where the honest, you know the, the ones that have not lost energy are and that will give rise to uh, to aberration uh, you know uh, deterioration of the image but most importantly in biological materials it means, that the sample is being damaged. And this is something that we have to avoid, okay, or minimize. So I'll, I'll tell you more about that. This, this is, so if, if you have not seen an electron microscope, I'll show you a couple of them. Uh, this is one, this is an schematic of the different components. And this is a, just a ray diagram um, so that you, you can see um, especially how uh, as the electrons um, go um, through through the sample and they are scattered. The um, the objecting cell uh, um, lens can recombine again the scattered and unscattered electrons to give rise to contrast via interference. Um, but uh, just very quickly, just the components. First of all, we need a source of electrons. Um, this is. Um, this is uh, an electron gun that is very often a uh, field emission uh, gun. So based on a, on a tunneling effect that will make the spread of energy of the electrons as small as possible. The fanciest one uh, are called field emission guns uh, that have really very minimal energy spread, uh, which of course is gonna be very important for the quality of the images. Then there is uh, a number of condenser lenses and apertures that will allow you to control the intensity uh, of, of the illumination on the sample and the size of the illuminated area. Then there is the critical um, um, objective lens and the sample typically goes into the middle of that objective lens. And this is the most critical one, of course, of the, of the microscope. It will generate, um, in, in, in the back focal plane, it will generate a, um, a diffraction pattern that you can choose to magnify. So you can do electron diffraction. You will do this only in the case of having crystalline uh, samples. Um, otherwise, the image plane will be the one being magnified by a series of projection, projection uh, lenses, the current of which will determine the magnification and ultimately the resolution that you're able to get. And at the end, of course, you have um, some recording media, which these days are um, 
um, direct electron detectors that I will mention uh, very quickly. It used to be a film. So when I was a PhD or even a postdoc, I collected data on film. There were, had, there were cassettes of 50 films that after you collected 50 images, you have to you know, uh, open the chamber, um, get those hours, put new ones, wait for vacuum to, uh, to recover. Uh, and then go to the dark room where you could listen to music or the news or whatever and go through the process of developing uh, the film that then had to be digital, digitally scanned. We moved to CCDs later that were non-optimal for working with, with our instruments. And about 10 years ago, we had a revolution in, uh, in, in detectors that really has uh, been the determining factor for the progress of cryo. In any case, um, I've... I've Thought I will show you one. This is a particular electron microscope where the casing has been removed because it has been used to, uh, is being used for the development of um, laser based faceplate for the electron microscope. This is super duper. Um, maybe you should uh, invite Holger Mueller from the physics department here to tell you about this because this is going to be another revolution in cryem. Uh, the microscope now has zillions of things hanging from, from it because it's been used for that, but just, just for scale, because that's me a few years ago. All right, so what is the attainable resolution through in a transmission electron microscope, like the one that I showed you? Um, so if you have the right um, instrument with the right aberration correction, um, so this will end up being really huge microscopes, on a sample that is not radiation sensitive, like this uh, nanocrystalline film of silicon, you can get sub angstrom resolution, okay? This is not the case. Uh, and this is from a single image, okay? This is a single image of this multi-twin uh, nanocrystal of silica. Mm, this is not the case for biological samples. Why? I told you some of, some of the reasons, okay. So the problem with biological macromolecules is that they really hate the vacuum. So uh, electrons of 300 kilo electron volts or so, they have a very high cross section compared say to uh, high energy X-rays for light atoms. We have to absolutely work under ultra high vacuum in the column of the electron microscope. And that's incompatible with having an AQ solution, which is where proteins have evolved to exist and function, okay? So this is a big problem. Then, Proteins have low contrast because they, as I said, they're made of light elements, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and very rarely some atoms of iron or something like that, but not many. Okay. But the most important is that they are radiation sensitive. Okay. And the image that I just showed you before of silicon probably used thousands of electrons per angstrom square on the sample. Um, during the data collection, okay, during the exposure. We can't do that because with those doses, the sample in the middle of the exposure would have evaporated, really, it's, you kind of disappear into, into gases, okay. So the solution is to do cryogenic electron microscopy, cryo-EM, where the sample is vitrified, which means is frozen, uh, at very fast rates, you know, hundreds of thousands of degrees per second is the rate, um, which means um, that the freezing is so quickly that the water molecules don't even have the time to reorganize into a crystal, okay? So this is a phase of water that is solid and amorphous, okay? And in this vitrified state, the sample, the biological sample are very nicely preserved and they can be inserted at liquid nitrogen into the ultra high vacuum of the microscope without the sample subliming, maintaining its solid state. Because the sample is well preserved, in principle, we should be able to get high resolution. But there are problems. Okay, so the low contrast is, is still an issue. And radiation damage is reduced but it's not eliminated, okay? So the primary damage is always done. You just slow down the diffusion of radicals by being at very extremely low temperatures. But we still have to work using low dose techniques where the sample is typically exposed in, in, of the order of 25, 30 electrons per angstrom square. 
Um, so what does this mean? The images are very noisy and we have to average many images of the object, um, of the same object, repeats of the object, typically um, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. Okay, so this is what we start with. We start with something that looked like this. It's a solution that has your protein, your purified protein of interest there in solution. Um, and we take a little volume. Uh, so, and in this solution, your macromolecule is diffusing. You have it under conditions where it's an, if it's an enzyme, it can, it can do the reaction, a polymerase could polymerize mRNA, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And we take a very small volume, put it on an EM grid. This is all for a scale with respect to a thumb. Um, and then of that drop that is on the, on, the, on the grid, we remove most of it. So because at the end, we were just to leave a film of water that just contains a layer of, uh, that is only once or twice or three times the size of your molecule in order to minimize a scattering from the water, which will be just background. Okay, so we do this um, using some instruments like the one shown here that has a chamber with controlled humidity and temperature. And the sample is held between filter paper that comes together for a finite number of time, removes most of the solution, uh, leaving just a very, very thin film that is then very quickly plunged into liquid ethane, okay, or liquid propane, something with a very high heat capacity, liquid nitrogen will not do, it will not vitrify, it doesn't cool fast enough. Once it's frozen, then we can transfer to liquid nitrogen, both for a storage or for insertion into the electron microscope. So in doing so, we go, sorry, <laughs> this thing is in Spanish, um, sorry about that. So we go to a sample that was in solution three-dimensionally to something that is in just a Thin film, this will be seen in cross section um, that is about the size of the molecule and is now frozen, hydrated, uh, is in a solid state and at temperatures that can be inserted into the electron microscope, as I said, without sublimation. Okay, so uh, the samples then are illuminated with electrons uh, and the transmission electron microscope actually, because of the focal length. Um, of, of, the, uh, of the instrument really gives you an image where the whole object is in focus. So it's a two-dimensional projection. If you want, it's the equivalent of an X-ray when you go to the doctors, okay? It's a projection is the integral of the density in the direction of the electron beam. So every image contains information on the whole object. It's not a section, it's not a surface rendering, it's a projection, okay? And because in principle, the object was randomly oriented when it was frozen, we will have many different views in many different projections of the object. This is actually an, a micrograph of one of these macromolecular assemblies. And the first thing that we do is uh, the process of selecting some, um, all the objects that are in, in the field of view to generate a gallery. This is a gallery in which we've gone through 2D classification corresponding to a certain side view of the object. And then we subject this class of views to rotational and translational in-plane alignment. And that allows us them to sum up uh, the images and generate averages where we've improved the signal to noise ratio. So now we can see details that before were buried in the noise. If we do this for different projections, directions, and then we find the relative orientation of those, um, of those projections by different means, I can tell you about it if someone asked me during the question time, uh, then we can then put them together through Fourier invasion, back projection, a number of methods to generate a three-dimensional structure of the object. This can be obtained at different resolutions. This particular one has a, has a resolution of about um, seven angstrom, okay? Uh, in some cases, there isn't one structure. There could be multiple structures that coexist in our solution, either with different composition or with different conformational states in different shapes. And the programs, the software that we use is powerful enough to be able to separate different states and get multiple reconstructions from just one single sample. 
So as I said, these density maps, then they have to be interpreted. At this resolution, we can see secondary structure in the protein. So proteins fold in uh, following certain patterns of what we call secondary structure. For example, they can form a helix where there are certain patterns of hydrogen bonds uh, that allows them the polypeptide chain to take that kind of shape. Um, they can, this can be connected and there can be other structures that are more stretched. Um, and what you see here in these different colors is what is called a ribbon diagram representation of the structure of the protein that shows you the path of the protein. Um, if, um, if you have higher resolution, you will be able to visualize the individual amino acids in the protein uh, and really get down to the chemistry of, of the protein surface and, and inside. Okay, so this methodology um, in 2017 um, got awarded the Nobel Prize to three pioneers in this field. Dubochet, who uh, developed the vitrification method. Uh, Richard Henderson, who was the first one to use it to obtain an atomic structure of a protein. And Joachim Frank, who developed the methodology for aligning images and, and doing that three-dimensional reconstruction that I, that I told you about. These people, um, I mean, Jack Dubochet was already retired when he got the Nobel Prize, really have done most of the groundbreaking work that they're were being honored for in the 70s and 80s. But it took this long to develop the methodology to a point that it became a very broadly used structural biology technique that was solving in very important um, complexes, uh, a structure very important complexes. Um, and that ha has happened really in the last eight years or so. So this delay was because the, the Nobel Committee waited until they realized that what these people have done really had had huge impact. Uh, and as I said, technology development, both in hardware and in software has made this technique now very broadly used to obtain atomic uh, structures um, of biological molecules. So um, in cryem, again, the frozen sample is inserted into a lot of microscope, electrons go through it and they generate 2D projections that are very noisy. We go through this 2D averaging, we go through the three-dimensional reconstruction. All of this is done computationally without the requirement for crystallization. So until, you know, before cryem was a, a mainstream a structural biology technique, the technique that dominated uh, the structural biology um, field was X-ray crystallography where proteins in very, very pure state in very high concentrated concentration underwent crystallization trials to make precipitate into ordered crystals that then would be taken to synchrotrons, to powerful X-ray sources to collect diffraction patterns in many different orientations. And then through computation that restore or try to restore phase information from the structure factors will by Fourier inversion recover the, the structure. That required that you could obtain huge amounts of the protein, that it would crystallize, the crystal was ordered enough that you could um, collect high resolution data, that you could face it and then do the, the tracing once there was a three dimensional uh, density map. So this was limited and it made that certain things, you know, were not being obtained. Polymers, large protein complexes, integral membrane proteins, which are, you know, um, very important biologically, but very hard to produce in large amounts and crystallize. So the lack of a requirement for crystallization is the big cell of this, of this technique. And then it has many consequences. It means you can study fully assembled complexes. I'll show you some of these complexes are really huge. There are millions and millions and millions of atoms, okay? And before the strategy was to break them down into pieces so that a particular piece could then be crystallized. And it was like, you, you disassemble the car, you, you get all the pieces in a row and then you say, okay, and now how do they come together to make a car? Um, so being able to do this without breaking things apart, studying what they are true units of biological function in conditions where they're still functional biochemically and they're able to do their reactions and this are, is very important. And um, because ultimately the cross section of 
electrons of the energies that I'm telling you about is about 10 to the four, 10 to the fifth times higher for carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, that X-rays of, of about one angstrom wavelength, it means that you need much less sample. So we can deal with tiny amounts. It means that it's even possible to just pull um, um, complexes out of, of, of um, you know, a solution of cells where they are present in very low, low amounts and just be barely detectable by biochemical means and you can still um, study them. So this is very powerful. Now, the thing that has really revolutionized CryEM so that we move from, you know, resolution that were in, a, you know, a few nanometers to a few angstrom uh, has been new detector technology that has given us images that are both, that both have higher contrast and higher resolution and software that has been, that implements maximum, maximum likelihood um, methods. Um, that has allowed us to really extract a, a lot more information from our images and in particular be able to separate different states that coexist. Proteins tend to be to move around and be in different states and being able to separate them and do parallel reconstructions instead of not realizing that they were different and mixing them up and getting something blurred like when, when someone moves during, during, during an image uh, during a photograph, that has meant that the resolution had truly improved. So now most cryo-EM studies of biological sample are in the order of three to seven angstrom, okay? Once you get to four angstrom, you can do ab initio structure determination. If you're lower than that, uh, you can do all the tricks um, to try to um, interpret your density map. In the case of the best samples, Okay, so samples that are very, very well behaved, they don't move much, they're very stable. And using absolutely the best electron microscope today with aberration correction, cold field emission guns, energy filters to deal, um, you know, um, this now has been demonstrated, you can get down to 1.2 angstrom resolution. And this is a resolution at which we can see hydrogen atoms. Um, so really very powerful. So I'm going to summarize and then I'm going to open it for questions about this first part, because the second part is going to be showing you examples of application to a couple of different biological systems. But this is a summary. This is a new age for cryo-electron microscopy, thanks to the new direct electron detectors. I can tell you more about what this means, but it, uh, I, don't, I don't want to distract you. And thanks to new image processing algorithms that are really, really powerful, highly convergent, um, um, and that has really pushed how far we can, we can use this technique, um, making it much more generally applicable and to have higher throughput. It used to be that, um, you know, it took many, many years to get to 10 ounce of resolution, and now it takes months to get to atomic resolution. So the user community has exploded. When I was a postdoc, I knew every single lab and person working on cryem now is, is unthinkable how many you know, thousands of people are doing it. It has become possible to do higher resolution structures and that means it becomes very interesting for biotech and pharmaceutical companies because they can use it for things like drug development like I was telling you, okay? And because we can separate multiple states, we can start to visualize molecular dynamics. We don't have kinetics. I can talk about why that is not, why we don't have kinetic, but we have um, dynamics if you, if, if you want. Um, but it really means we go beyond uh, just a, having a single static structure, okay? Uh, so this has, is having a huge imp impact and really global interest. The National Institute of Health um, just a couple of years ago declared that the most impactful techniques that were out there to do biological studies were one, um, sequencing, genome sequences, obviously very important. Two, CRISPR technology. I don't know if you heard about this, but this is a technology that again gave rise to the Nobel Prize um, in chemistry, actually to my colleague, Jennifer Doutner, my next door neighbor. 
um, that is used for genome engineering so that you can change what is you know, the genetic information of any particular cell or organism. And the third was cryo-electron microscopy for the, term, the determination of a structural or macromolecular structure. Okay, so really huge impact. I want to take a little break now and ask for uh, questions at this point about anything that I told you so far. We'll take a little uh, breather and then I'll really just show you examples which are gonna be like a gallery of structures and, um, and hopefully you will see why it's relevant to get those, uh, those structures. Um, okay, so we have one question from YouTube. Okay. Um, uh, Henio Martins asks, does the energy of the electron beam depend on the sample that is being processed and does it need to be tuned for each sample? No, we, we, there are, we know what is the optimal energy, uh, both in, in terms of maximizing uh, scattering, uh, elastic scattering versus inelastic scattering, um, and, and how to work with the optics. And it really is around 200, 300 kilo electron volts. It is true that when I studied thick samples, like sections of cells, not, not just solutions of protein, but thick sections of cell, um, they've been, they, they have been a tendency to work at higher energies, like all the way to one mega electron volt. You can not imagine how huge those electron microscopes were. That even that has kind of fallen um, in, misuse it is the, the use has fallen so no really the energy is fixed the detectors are now optimized for certain energy and it works very well for mm, basically all biological samples of a certain thickness which is what we pursue rather than charging the energy of the electrons we we think things to um you know we make things enough uh to work within those energies is, is a good question um, another question by Henry Machines also is, um, out of curiosity, how expensive is cryo-EM technology? Yeah, yeah, it is unfortunately pretty expensive. So um, electron microscope comes in different sizes. It's like the Goldilocks kind of thing. Um, so there are microscopes that are used more for a screening, very quick a screening, that are more of the order of... Um, 400, half a, half a million dollars. Uh, then there are medium scopes that are about two or three million. Uh, there are the, the ones that are, you know, really are excellent for atomic resolution, you know, for getting to two, three angstrom um, that are of the order of five million. And then if you want the top of the pops, the one that gives you all the way to 1.2, which will have things like mon electron monochromators or um, aberration, chromatic aberration, or, or, or um, a spherical aberration correction, energy filters, that kind of blows away to, I don't know, $10 million. All of this is dollars. So it is expensive. Um, it means not everybody can have one. There are consortia that are now in the States, a number of national facilities, just like for synchrotrons, because it is, I mean, it's not as expensive as a, as a synchrotron, but it is expensive. We also have two questions in, in the chat. Do you want me to read them or the person can open their mics? Whatever they want. Okay, clever song. Uh, do you want to read me to read or? Um, Maybe you read it. Yeah, okay. Um, how can we guarantee with using this method that the protein structure has not been modified? Is there any way to test it? Right. Yeah. So at the end of the day, the, the, once you get to a resolution of about three, around three angstrom, the tendency map um, will be interpreted in terms of an atomic model. We know the rules. We know, uh, and you know, it ha it's like a huge three-dimensional puzzle that has to fit this long change of amino acid with very defined uh, chemical groups. And you can see whether this, this fitting, whether there's parts that are missing, whether the, the structure makes sense. Um, so, but we can start seeing that there are certain damage that occurs. For example, 
um, negatively charged amino acids, they get, get decarboxylated is the first of a radiation damage effects. And for the typical doses that we use, we've already started losing those groups. And we can see there's a lack of density uh, for those particular side chains. Uh, and, you know, working with lower dose probably is not always feasible. When it's feasible, it can be seen then that you recover um, those, um, uh, those groups, those chemical groups. So there's been that slide uh, loss um, damage, but within the regime of what I, what I told you, 25, um, 30 electrons per ounce square, that may, is the only damage that you in principle cause through, um, to, through the electron beam. Maybe we'll just take the last one and then we move on and... Yeah, okay. Um, in it's Luis's question, in the reconstruction of the 3D structure, you mentioned that it's possible to have different types of structure in the same sample. Which yeah. kind of constraints do you use to discriminate between different structures? And do you use some kind of biophysical constraints? We don't discriminate. So the encoded in the sequence of the protein um, is the, the conformation of the protein. So certain amino acids will fold, will rearrange forming a certain structure. So um, th there are exceptions, prions, things like that, but I'm not going to talk about that because they are the exceptions that confirm the rule. A gene, a sequence of DNA, define a sequence of mRNA, defines a sequence of amino acids, and the sequence of amino acids defines the structure. And, and the, the structure regionally could form a helix and then have a stension and then form another structure. And that is defined. And what we have to do is just visualize it to then um, you know, determine it because, um, so you may have heard uh, that now protein can be predicted this, this, this alpha fold of the Google alpha fold. So for relatively small, uh, small pieces of, of proteins, um, there is now enough information that you can, um, predict the structure without actually looking and experimentally defining it. Um, thus, is artificial intelligence or is, is not absolutely for basic principle is based on previous knowledge from many other sequences. There are people that are trying to predict truly from basic principle using energy functions uh, and minimizing energy of interaction among all these charges and hydrophobic barriers and things like that. But in any case, the structure is defined. There are different segments that follow patterns that are very directly recognizable and got their own names, but the structure of a protein is defined. And that's why we are able to visualize it by averaging many of them and, and, and just explicitly uh, defining it. Okay, so let me give you, with that is a great um, entry to the examples. Um, so I've been working for many years on microtubules. Um, they are, cylindrical tubes made out of repeats of a protein that is called tubulin. It's, it's very nice when actually proteins have names that really define what they do. There are other names that are really terrible, like, you know, CDC24 or something. <laughs> but in any case, um, microtubules are, are these uh, hollow cylinders that are made of proteins that bind to many copies bind to each other just like Lego pieces and make these microtubules, which play many different roles uh, in the cell. They're involved in organizing the contents of the cell. They're involved in separating chromosomes during cell division. They're involved in giving the, the, the cell its different shape, like a neuron with a very long axon. axon. Okay, so microtubules are critical. They're present in all cells. Uh, in all type of cells, whether it's body, yeast, flies, or you and I, uh, and they're very important for cell the, our understanding of cell biology. So we've studied microtubules using cryo-EM. This is just a, a section of a microtubule defined at a resolution of 3.5 angstrom. This is a resolution where we can trace the polypeptide change, find every amino acid, five, find every chemical group and how interact within the, the, the polymer or how it's exposed to interacting with other things. 
So this is a polymer that actually exists in a metastable state. Unlike Legos, this is a polymer that is constantly growing and then uh, is metastable in the sense that undergo transition to a depolymerization state. And this energetically make only sense if there is a source energy. That source of energy comes in the form of hydrolysis of, um, of a molecule that is called guanosine triphosphate. And the hydrolysis, like the break of the last, um, um, the, um, the breaking of a bond that releases inorganic phosphate is read by the protein. So normally it binds GTP. The GTP is hydrolyzed to GDP diphosphate. That generates a hole in the protein that is read by the protein and the protein changes shape. And when it changes shape, the microtubule becomes unstable. The forces that keeps it together uh, are, are relaxed and it falls apart. And this is something that we have studied. It is absolutely critical for the functioning of microtubules, like for the alignment of chromosomes and then their separation. And because of this, you can use drugs, small molecules that bind to pockets in tubulin and it stops this behavior so that microtubules don't, cannot be destabilized. And that leads to a process in which this, a cell that is in the middle of dividing when it has duplicated these chromosomes and they want to separate them, cannot do so. And then after trying and trying and trying, it commits apoptosis, which is cell suicide. And this has been used, is used to treat cancer. So we visualize some of these molecules in particular Taxol, which is a major um, drug in the treatment of solid tumors like, um, like uh, prostate or breast, uh, um, breast cancer. And, um, and this has given us information of how it acts uh, and also provides pharmaceutical companies with information of how to change uh, or improve these, these drugs. In the cell, the microtubules that do all of these different jobs interact with many proteins. They interact with proteins that use also chemical energy to walk along the microtubule, um, just like as if the microtubule was a freeway. These are called motor proteins. One of them is kinesin. There are other proteins that regulate the dynamics of microtubules. There are proteins that cross links one microtubule with another, giving rise to larger organizations. There are proteins that are able to nucleate and promote the assembly of microtubules. And there are proteins like neuronal tau. This is a protein that is enriched in neurons um, that is uh, involved in the stabilization and again, organization of the microtubules in the axon. I mentioned tau in particular because tau sometimes go bad um, because of genetic mutations or because um, it gets chemically modified in the cell in, in a way that it shouldn't. And then it comes, it peels off microtubules and it forms amyloids. And these amyloids give rise to tauopathies, you know, medical conditions, the most famous of which is Alzheimer's. So it was very important to obtain the structure of the functional tau bind to the microtubule. Another group obtained the structure of tau in these amyloid fibrils and then comparing the two, we could get information of what it is that drives this conversion from something that is functional to something that self aggregates into, um, into these amyloid fib fibrils that are very damaging to our neurons. Okay, so th th that was an animation of people that had of many people working in my lab over the years, most of them have their own labs now uh, in, the, uh, in the United States and, in, and abroad, China, Europe, etc. But let me go back. My second example <clears throat> in the last few minutes have to do with this process called transcription in which RNA polymerase copies a gene into messenger RNA. Everything has RNA polymerases. The, um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 uh, has a polymerase that has been studied, um, is targeted by certain antivirals. Uh, the structures immediately um, were resolved um, when the pandemic broke. Um, 
that's viral if you go to bacterial they become larger if you go to us they become really really large and then they don't uh, they even need many accessory factors so as you go up in the evolutionary scale the molecular machinery that is involved in this in this process becomes more and more complicated and convoluted you may wonder why and it all has to do with regulation the the regulation of gene expression is very important we don't have many more genes than a fly but we have very complex way of regulating them in any case um, one of the things that has to happen is that in this huge sea, uh, um, sea of, of of dna of our genome the polymerase has to find the beginning of a gene with a precision that is chemical in nature, is, is a single uh, nucleotide, you know, a single one of the units that forms this DNA. And this requires, this is never done, you know, this is, this is done again by protein and protein complexes that use their shape, the chemistry of their surface to read the sequence of DNA. So in, in, in eukaryotic cells, in cells like your, yours and mine, this is done by a transcription factor 2D historical name that is made up of 14 different proteins. This adds up to well over a million atoms. So I, this is something really, really huge. And this is the complex that recognizes that binds to the DNA and is able to read sequences. And when he, he sees that is the right sequence around the transcription start site, he recruits the polymerase. And ultimately you have this large supramolecular assembly that has, you know, uh, you know millions and uh, uh, millions of, uh, you know, two or three million um, Daltons that uh, assembles on particular sequences on DNA that include the polymerase itself and other factors, for example, this TF2H factor, which uses again, chemical energy to do work. And the work is to move on the DNA to ultimately open it up. You, you know that the DNA from this duplex, this double helix, which is great for storage, but it has to be unraveled for the polymerase to be able to read one of the strands and make a copy of the mRNA. So that requires energy that is also carried out uh, by this, uh, by, by the green complex that you see here. We've studied all of this. Um, so the thing that is amazing is I told you these molecules, the move, okay? So this is just a superposition of class averages, okay? It's not a real movie. There's no timing here. There's no time coordinate, but it shows how this molecule, which is 1.3 megadaltons in size, have a lobe that moves across. The movement is 150 angstrom. It is really, really large for a molecule. And we can position that lobe, the yellow lobe with respect to the blue segment and see that it's, it kind of oscillate between two major style, uh, est states that we call uh, canonic and reorganized. And, um, and then when you add DNA, the, shift, the state shift towards the reorganized state. And when we look at the structure, is this reorganized state where this lobe, yellow lobe have moved to the other end that is bound to DNA. We did these studies a very long time ago when we didn't have direct detectors or the powerful software that we have these days. So the resolution was only about 40 angstrom, really, really poor. Um, we were able to improve the structure both by using direct electron detect detectors, but also by purifying the complex that is stably bound to DNA rather than having a mixture. And what we were able to see is when the complex is very stably bound to DNA. Of this lobe, only part is clearly seen and is stably bound to one end of the DNA, which is this linear uh, tube that you see here. The rest becomes really flexible and is missing, you know, is messing up with an alignment. So we, we eliminate it through the imaging procedure and we refine just based on the rest of the structure to improve it. And then we could interpret it um, using different tricks in terms of protein structure to define uh, the elements that are involved in DNA binding. And ultimately we were able to use CRYM more and more sophisticated with more data, with more data processing 
to get the full structure of the protein, um, of the protein complex in, in, his, in, his, in all its complexity. But most importantly, we saw the structure by itself, the structure with DNA, the details of the different modules uh, that are doing different things in the structure and how the motion relates to the engagement of DNA and the deployment of this red protein, which is the one that then will bring the polymerase to the DNA so that the transcription start site, which is right here, based on sequences around it, will be located. So we, we've studied this, we've studied the process of recruitment of the polymerase and all of this, and this is summarized in a movie that I'm gonna show you right now, okay? This is many years of a study, many different publications. So the complex have move, movable elements. Some of these movable elements recognizes proteins that wrap the DNA close to where the start of the gene is. And this allows the complex to really have the, the, the opportunity to touch, chemically touch the DNA until it recognizes the sequences. And only when it does, um, it releases this red protein, which is otherwise inhibited, like kind of covered up. Um, and when it's free and released from the complex, it can bind to a factor that then binds to the polymerase. So we've studied then the process of how the polymerase, which again is really huge, is half a megadalton, is recruited uh, to the DNA through interaction with these factors, and then how it assembled one factor after another, TF2F, TF2E, to ultimately bring about the workhorse, the molecular machine TF2H that has the ATPase activity, the capacity to hydrolyze ATP to generate energy that is used for uh, working on, on DNA. So there's conformational changes that happen on this complex up and coming um, here. And then uh, again, this, this blue part changes conformation as it consumes ATP and in the process walks on the DNA, pushes it into the polymerase, generate torques that uh, supercoils and then unravels the DNA. And that uh, is then one single strand is captured by the polymerase. Now this complex had a, a dangling component domain that is actually used to cause a chemical modification in the polymerase. And this also important for other aspects of cell function of the sort that makes it again a target for anti-cancer therapies. We, we, we have been able to visualize that module using cryoEM bound to an inhibitor that is now in clinical trials for cancer treatment and is seen right here. And we were able to obtain, obtain 2.5 angstroms. This is a resolution at which we can really model in great detail um, the, the, both the protein uh, the molecule that is bound to it, we can even see water molecules. So this is the kind of information that now, again, um, companies can use to change, uh, improve the, the efficacy of this complex, how uh, much is able to recognize one pro protein versus another and improve it, okay? Again, this is a summary of many people working over the years, this, these little animations. Um, and many of them, you know, are now have a lab of, of their own in this era where cryoEM is really exploding and there's so many uh, macromolecular complexes that we can start to understand at the molecular level. And with this, uh, thank you all for your attention and hopefully you will have more questions that can be either about the biology or more about the technique. I'm happy to answer them all. Um, shall I stop the sharing? Um, you, what you prefer? I um, mean, it depends. If you I'm can leave it on. If of people, then I'll stop. Otherwise, I can keep it because I can go to a slide to show any particular thing that people may want to. Yeah, um, I, we have some questions on YouTube, so okay. I'll, I'll read them. But first, I'd like to thank you for for the presentation. It was really, really interesting i i think that everybody can agree <laughs> it's really inspiring um so um on youtube we have 
two questions from Mauricio Vieira Critz. Um, can cryo-EM detect movement and chemical transformations or chemical reactions? And if not, what would be needed to detect them? Okay, so um, cryo-EM can detect different states. So it can see, it can analyze the images of these many, many copies of that particular macromolecule and see that it exists in different states, okay? And it can even tell you whether mm, this state is predominant, this is rare, and this is almost never present. Okay, so it gives you an idea of the equilibrium, the thermodynamic equilibrium. What it doesn't see is actual motion. That's why we don't get any kinetic information because the sample is frozen in time. You have something, you know, molecules where each one of them was doing their motion, okay? And then we froze it. So everyone was frozen in a different state. Now, statistically, the distribution of states among identical molecule in this ensemble corresponds to the distribution of states that one molecule will follow through time. But the rate is information that we have lost. So it could be that this motion is like this or that is like this, we cannot tell. So that cannot be seen. Now. Chemical modification. Once you get to a resolution of two, two and a half angstrom, you can see a modification. For example, if a protein is modified where a certain amino acid um, gets attached with a, with a phosphate, which is a very common modification in proteins, you can see that it has been modified. Um, an enzymatic reaction. You can see different states through an enzymatic reaction if it's occurring um, and you're looking at equilibrium and, and it's, it's, you, know, you have turned over, you can see the different stages. If the changes are small, you, you need higher and higher resolution, but that is possible. So you can visualize things that are moving by doing this statistical analysis of the frozen ensemble, but you lose what information you don't get is kinetic. We're not watching movies. We're more watch, watching one molecule at a time that was frozen in a different state, just randomly, as you know, we did the freezing. Hopefully, that's clear because it's a very important concept. Okay, just let me check if we have more questions on YouTube. If not, we can end the broadcast. They're in move on to the discussion here at Zoom. Um, yeah, I think we have no more questions there. We can stop the broadcast and, and move on to the Zoom discussion again. I think Ricardo has a, has a question. Okay. Yeah, sorry to 